Hi, my name is Maurice Magala and I am one of the third year ophthalmology residents from Yale University. It is my pleasure to present at the June 2020 Connecticut Society of Eye Physicians meeting. I will be discussing a case of a patient that I had the pleasure of seeing earlier this year whose management was guided under the expertise of Dr. Martha Howard. The authors have no financial disclosures or conflicts of interest to report. The patient is a 65-year-old male with a history significant for refractive error who presented to the emergency room with binocular vertical diplopia after sustaining right facial injury with a drill. He denied pain in primary gaze, vision changes, flashes, floaters, curtains, or veils. Past medical, surgical, social, and family history were non-contributory. Near uncorrected visual acuity was 2025 in the right eye and 2020 in the left. Pupils were symmetric and brisk without a relative afferent pupillary defect. Confrontational visual fields and color plates were full in both eyes. In this slide, we share photos of the patient's motility exam. In the bottom image, we can see a minus three infraduction deficit of the right eye, and in fact, the patient noted pain while looking in this direction. A closer look at the right orbit and globe revealed a full thickness margin involving lower lid laceration with destruction of the lateral canthus. Inferior subconjunctival hemorrhage was also noted, as was the traumatic end of the inferior rectus muscle, denoted here as the muscle body with overlying striations above the Q-tip. No hyphema or signs of globe rupture were noted. Posterior segment exam of both the right and left eye were unremarkable. The differential diagnosis for diplopia after trauma include muscle entrapment, intramuscular hematoma contusion, intramuscular tear or rupture, cranial nerve palsy, or decompensated strabismus. While in the emergency room, the patient had a CAT scan of the orbit which showed no evidence of globe rupture, retroblubber hemorrhage, or orbital wall fractures. There are multiple small foci of gas and a small amount of edema noted in the right orbit inferior to the right globe. The patient was admitted for systemic antibiotics as well as steroids to help reduce the inflammation of the soft tissue in the right orbit prior to his anticipated surgery. He received a tetanus shot as well as copious amounts of ointment to the right globe and a shield placed over the right eye. We requested MRI orbits to help better visualize the soft tissue of the orbit prior to surgery. Irregularity, thickening, and edema of the right inferior rectus muscle, particularly near the globe insertion, was noted. The multiple foci of gas that were noted on the CAT scan were unable to be reevaluated on MRI. Injury to the inferior oblique was also unable to be excluded on imaging. Intraoperatively, a full thickness inferior conjunctival laceration was noted. A conjunctival pyridomy from this laceration to the lateral rectus passing inferiorly was made using Westcott scissors and 0.12 forceps. There was no underlying scleral laceration noted. Bone dissection using Westcott scissors was performed and using Stevens and Jameson hooks, the lateral rectus was isolated and noted to be intact at its appropriate insertion site. Attention was directed to the right inferior rectus, which was noted to have a full thickness transection 14 millimeters from its insertion site. Blunt dissection using Westcott scissors was performed inferiorly to identify the distal end of the inferior rectus, which was found to be quite fragile and macerated, as can be seen in this photograph. Using 6O double armed vicral suture in a horizontal mattress pattern with double locking bites, what remained of the inferior rectus muscle was sutured together. The inferior oblique was noted to be intact and at its appropriate insertion. Attention was also directed to the right full thickness margin involving laceration and lateral canthus laceration. They were both repaired. This slide reveals photographs of the eyelids as well as the globe immediately taken after the surgery. Extraocular muscle trauma most commonly involves the medial and inferior rectus muscle due to their proximity to the limbus 
being 5.5 and 6.5 millimeters respectively and their exposure during the protective bells phenomenon. Types of extraocular muscle trauma include tear or rupture, transection, or avulsion. Most inferior rectus muscle trauma are in association with orbital floor fracture. In a review of the literature, we found only one case of inferior rectus lysis without an associated orbital floor fracture hypothesized to be due to muscle ischemia from contusion of the muscle during the trauma. For our patient, we believe that the lower eyelid anatomy and its relation to the inferior rectus played a role in what transpired. To review, the capsule palpebral fascia starts from the inferior rectus muscle sheath, encircles the inferior oblique as it passes anteriorly, and then inserts into the inferior rectus. We hypothesized that our patient's inferior rectus transection may have been due to the pull of the lower eyelid during the trauma from the drill that tore the capsule palpebral fascia and the inferior rectus along with it. Surgical management of such a patient is very interesting as it is challenging. Some reports of anterior transposition of inferior oblique have proved promising for helping restore some of the um, loss of function from traumatized inferior rectus muscle. There has also been some reports of transposition and resection of portions of the remaining horizontal rectus muscles as well. In <clears throat> the bottom image, we show the modified Hommelstein procedure, which, although traditionally used to treat weakened horizontal rectus muscles, can be adapted to a weakened vertical muscle. In the Hummelsheim, the muscle belly of the vertical rectus muscles are split and their tendons disinserted. Those ends are then reinserted adjacent to the defective horizontal rectus muscle. In the modified Jensen procedure, the tendons are not disinserted at all, but rather remain at their original insertion sites and sutures anchor the split muscle belly of the vertical rectus muscle to the weakened horizontal rectus muscle. Such an adaptation for weakened vertical rectus muscles was described in Pacey and Coates. At a follow-up visit, our patient revealed persistent vertical, torsional, and horizontal strabismus. He was measured to be 12 prison diopters of right hypertropia at distance. He was planned for a horizontal muscle transposition in the form of a modified Jensen procedure as described by Pacey and Coates to help improve his down gaze, which was essential given his job operating machinery. He was also planned for a Harada Ito procedure to help treat the torsional strabismus. However, both procedures needed to be placed on hold due to COVID. Here we present some questions to help reflect on the important aspects of the case. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present this patient. For any more questions or information, please contact me at maries.migala at yale.edu.